and gentlemen, I would like to remind you that there's a special rung in hell for people who steal other people's comic book collections. As you can see here, our set looks a little bit different than past iterations. Recently, it's been come to our attention that the comic book collection was stolen. The thief is described as a tall man bearing somewhat of a resemblance to Ryan Reynolds and or Tom Cruise. We couldn't figure it out uh, who it was based on sketches because his face was horribly scarred. One witness report states that he escaped uh, talking to himself in two other voices. Another witness reports that there was a mentioning of chimichangas repeatedly. Chimichangas, chimichangas, chimichangas. However, it was the third uh, witness report that was the most intriguing because he was wearing a green mini skirt and green halter top with a yellow face mask uh, singing I Feel Pretty. We have no idea who this man is, but we would like your help in finding anything Yoinks. you can say. Son of a, he stole the... Ladies and gentlemen, the oral history of comics. Let's bring you down to the 70s. Ladies and gentlemen, we're at the 70s. The 70s are an interesting time for comics. Now, I'm going to start off uh, a little differently tonight. I'm going to go by company tonight, just for the moment. Now, Marvel Comics had some problems in the 60s with the tr distribution to newsstands. The problem with Marvel was that they were basically owned by DC Comics on a distribution level. Because DC Comics' is independent news was distributing them, there was a cap on how many titles uh, Marvel could produce. When Marvel Comics became one of the biggest sellers in the 60s, the cap was lifted. And because the cap was lifted, there was this increase in books and characters that could be made. And because Marvel had very good artists uh, doing freelance work for them, Jack Kirby, Steve Ditko, and many others uh, come to mind. Because of the lift, there was a increase in sales. However, with all the increase in sales, with all the crazes and stuff, it's like any other bubble, when it bursts, like things break down. Well, when comics market crashed in the late 60s, uh, Marvel in particular went to a new distributor. Stan Lee wanted to copy, or not copy, but he was inspired by uh, the magazine format that Mad Magazine used, that Creepy and Eerie used, that have circumvented the Comics Code Authority. Stan Lee had a little annoyance with the Comics Code Authority. Now, most people say that the code problems they had, like, things were, they were nitpicky. Well, they weren't going to be so much nitpicky as in they actually had a leg to stand on. When the U.S. government, in their war on drugs, asked Stan Lee to write a anti-drug 
message into an issue of Spider-Man. Stan Lee obligingly, Stan Lee obligingly gives Harry Osborn a drug addiction. And the Comics Code didn't approve of it, but Stan Lee published it anyway. So, there you go. Stan Lee versus Comics Code Authority. The winner is Stan Lee. Because of this, in 1971, the Comics Code Authority uh, revised their rules. They revised the fact that you could depict drugs in a negative manner, and you could use monsters. Stan Lee, after 27 years of being uh, editor-in-chief, I believe, not counting the two years of Vince Fago while he was while Stan Lee was uh, serving in the military, steps down as editor-in-chief and becomes publisher. And Stan Lee wasn't really a publisher. He wasn't a numbers guy. It wasn't his kind of job. But what happens after Stan Lee steps down is been referred to as the revolving door of editors-in-chief. Stan Lee pit uh, successor was Roy Thomas. Roy Thomas lasted two years then he stepped down to focus on writing. Then Len Wein took up the torch. He lasted, I think, a year. Then, uh... Marv Wolfman took up the torch. He lasted a year. Jerry Conway took, took up the torch, but he lasted a month. Then you... Or at, one of them lasted a month. I don't know if it was Jerry Conway, but I'm pretty sure it was a short amount of time. Then, Archie Goodwin uh, takes up editor-in-chief for a year but he steps down. And lo and behold, Jim Shooter, who started co working in comics at the age of 14, becomes editor-in-chief in 1978, I want to say. Under Jim Shooter, there are many stories, I would imagine. There are a lot of issues that happened. But Jim Shooter, for lack of a better reason, worked with uh, Jim Galton to get the books on time, to get things in order, to ha allow things to happen creatively that weren't so much happening before. And he took on a number of unpopular stances. He also worked with a lot of people that were um, like, there's one story of he used a letter because other people wouldn't use her work because she was too big. Well, her letters were too big, not her, but she would letter too big. Oh boy, I'm going to get shot for this one. John Byrne and Chris Claremont's... Uh, Dark Phoenix Saga is one of the great all-time masterpieces of serialized comics. When John Byrne drew in a planet that Phoenix destroys, upstairs Jim Shooter says that because all those lives were destroyed on that planet, the Phoenix has to get her comeuppance. So, she dies in the end. Sorry if I ruined it for all you people out there. But, Phoenix dies, and everything is different now. Like, no one thought that was possible to kill a main character in a title that she's been with for how long? Unfortunately, the problem with comics is that heroes don't die for long. <laughs> they go into hibernation, they go into... Uh, a status where it's up in the air and they're not able to be used but as soon as the story comes along that they can be used and it brings them back reasonably or not even reasonably it just brings them back in a spectacular way they will bring them back so heroes don't die famous examples Captain America another famous example Batman Another famous example, Superman. 
And another famous example, and probably the original, Jean Grey the Phoenix. How many times has she died and come back again? And a pro problem with Jean Grey, though, is that Dark Phoenix Saga probably kicks off one of the greatest continuity uh, blips ever. It's like, how do we bring her back? Oh, we just set up this mythology. Well, don't we already have this one girl that's like this and just looks just like her and all that? Wouldn't this affect that status? Oh, sure, go ahead. We'd like this one. So, Scott Summers' second wife, uh, Madeline Pryor, goes uh, crazy and all that. And, like, Phoenix is brought back. And then dies again. And was like, oh, how do we beat around the bush and bring her back this time? Well, I'll let you guys read the books to find that one out. In the 70s, there was something of a coup to start with. Jack Kirby had drawn for Marvel for a long time, and he was very much associated with Marvel characters. Jack Kirby, in 1969, left Marvel and started working at DC uh, in the 70s, early 70s, late. One of the things about Jack Kirby's creations at DC is that they are largely used today almost as much as his... Marvel counterparts, Marvel creations. However, they are not nearly as popular or as well known. Everybody knows Jack Kirby created half of Marvel. Not everybody remembers how many characters he made at DC, but you can point them out very easily because of his style. Jack Kirby's uh, books he edited, drew, and wrote. He had four books. He had uh, the New Gods, he had the Forever People, he had Mr. Miracle, and he had Superman's pal, Jimmy Olsen. The Superman's pal, Jimmy Olsen book came about because DC asked him to take on their lowest selling title. And he did. Because that's how the industry works. They give you something, you do something. The books did not sell nearly as well as they had hoped they would. And Jack Kirby had to see them canceled. However, he was under contract for other books. So what Jack Kirby ended up working on was The Demon, uh, where he cr uh, created a, a mythical creature bonded to a knight who was from King Arthur's court. He created OMAC, One Man Army Corps, which was a, really a futuristic um, uh, Captain America. And he created Commandy, which was the last boy on Earth, which was sort of a battle, uh, battle between animals that are human-like and the last human. And Commandy was... Sort of like Planet of the Apes, almost, but different. And it was very much original and very much like to this day. Jack Kirby eventually went back to Marvel in the late 70s.